Yeah, good morning. Yeah, that's a good reminder, uh, Canaan. Uh, that's when we sing songs, uh, hopefully they're based on the Word of God. And we do try to do that. And to the goodness of God, uh, it says in Psalms 23, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And that word follow is not a, you know, kind of this little stroll through the park. It's pursuing. Goodness and mercy will pursue me. So that's biblical. Uh, Surely your goodness is running after me. Yeah, that's biblical. This song that we just sang is biblical. We'll dismiss the kids here in just a moment. I just want to remind us where this comes from. I hadn't planned on doing this. Uh, Matthew 7 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus speaking, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And this is why we want to be both in the word of God, and we want to be applying God's word to our life. Right? That's where it really comes. Hearing it and not applying it, that's, that's not what God is looking for. That's not good enough. The rain is going to come, the wind's going to blow. If you're not building your life on the rock, applying what it is that you're learning, yeah, you're going to fall. It's so important to be grounded on truth. Uh, that's kind of be the emphasis here of the youth group as well as we move forward. And one of the things that we're going to be emphasizing is a, a daily quiet time. Not in a legalistic sense, but encouraging the youth. Hey, be in the word on a daily basis. And the leaders are committing to do that as an example. If some individuals who aren't part of the youth group would like to participate in that, we have a book that we're going through. Uh, We'll get you that as well. And it can be something that the whole church is kind of supporting the youth in that sense. We don't want to be a statistic. We want our teenagers to be growing up, hearing the things of God, and then when they're leaving high school, remaining grounded in their relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the goal. So, all right. That wasn't planned. Uh, Go ahead and we'll dismiss the kids to children's group this morning. Yeah, we got some. Eamon, you're too big. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Eamon's a good sport. Okay, this morning we are back in 2 Thessalonians. If you've got your Bible, I'd like you to open there, 2 Thessalonians 2. If you don't have your Bible, there is a Bible provided for you, right in front of you. So you can reach under there and get it. 2 Thessalonians, towards the back of the Bible. It's getting there towards the back. There's a table of contents in the front if you need it. It can help you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As you're looking for it, as you're finding the passage this morning... I'm going to bring up something that seems random at first, but it'll make sense here in a moment. Do you know that one-third of Americans, according to a 2021 survey, one-third of Americans now believe in reincarnation? Now, that is surprising enough, but it's actually a higher percentage among people who are 50 years and younger. So this actually indicates that there's a shift going on in our society, a shift in worldview, because the younger, it's even a higher percentage, the 50 and over is less than a third, right? But it averages out to a third overall. And that's really interesting because that's not just a belief that kind of take it or leave it, maybe who's to say, right? Uh, If you believe in reincarnation, that assumes that time is cyclical, right? It just goes on in an endless loop. You're born, you die, you're born again, you die, you're born again, you die, and it's just this endless loop. And that is not what the Bible teaches, The Bible actually has a stance on this, that time is linear. It has a beginning and it has an end from our vantage point, from our vantage point. Now, God, he is not like us. God is transcendent. He's not bound by space and time. He can, he's anywhere. He's omnipresent, right? And he exists outside of time. Now, because he exists outside of time, he can see things that are to come, things that we have not experienced yet, those of us who are inside of time. He can see what lies ahead, and he can tell us what's coming. And this is something that actually proves that our God is the true God, that he is the real one. He says, and I believe it's Isaiah, he's like, yeah, go ahead and pray to your idols. Go ahead and pray to 
that thing that you're worshiping. See if they can tell you what's going to come and it actually be true. Yeah, they can't do that. God can. And this is one of those passages that actually speaks to this linear aspect of time. This is something towards the end. We know that God said in the beginning, Genesis 1, and now things are moving towards the end of human history. And he's showing us what is going to come. And before the end, there's a series of climactic events. Things get uh, revved up higher and higher. There's some really important events that happen near the end of human history. And we're talking about one of these things here this morning. And so there's a temptation. It's a confusing passage. It's coming in the future. There's a temptation to be like, you know, I don't really care about what this has to say because it doesn't affect me today. It, it actually does. It actually does. It, you can apply this to your life in the here and now. And I think we'll see as we move into this this morning. So let's go ahead and read it. Uh, we've, we've read this like three Sundays in a row now, but this is a, there's a lot here to unpack. But this is kind of the last Sunday that we're handling this. We'll, we'll start moving on after this. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Read the whole thing here just to keep it all in context. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So I've shared this slide last week. I'll share it again this week. St. Augustine, really famous guy, famous theologian, he says, I admit that the meaning of this completely escapes me. And I just find that somewhat humorous that he would go ahead and say that about this passage. It's complicated, but I think that we can make good progress in understanding this, understanding what God has for us here, if we can answer some certain questions here. So let's just remind ourselves of the questions that we've got to answer if we're going to properly understand this. Uh, if you can pull up that slide. Uh, the first question, of course, would be, what did the forged letter say? And we talked about that uh, last week. We answered that. Uh, what is the apostasy? Rebellion, falling away, your translation might say. What is the mystery of lawlessness? We talked about that last week. Who is the man of lawlessness? And who or what is the restrainer? If we can answer these questions, put an answer beside all these, I think we'll understand really a whole lot of what this passage is trying to teach us. So yeah, we've already handled a couple of them. Last week we talked about the, the forged letter. What, right? what did it say? It said that uh, basically the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord has come. God is already pouring out his judgment on the earth. He's already initiated this sequence of events. And they are alarmed, they're unsettled, because their understanding from what Paul had taught previously was that uh, that was not going to happen yet. And here it is. They are experiencing some hardships, and now here's a letter that looks like it's from Paul, and it says that it's already come, so that they believe that. They believe this falsehood, and um, Paul's correcting that. That's part of the reason he wrote this letter in the first place. We talked about the mystery of lawlessness last week as well, and how there is a trend away from God in our institutions, in our society. Everything is the lawlessness here. I believe that is saying against God's rule, against God's authority. Uh, there's a power already at work. People progressively reject God's rule in their, in their lives, in their society, whatever. We drift away from God. 
You can start off with good intentions, but slowly over time, it drifts. There's a mystery of lawlessness already at work. All right, but let's keep going and start talking about these other things here in uh, this passage. And I'm talking about these things in a chronological order, not necessarily the order that the passage is talking about them, because I think it helps us understand. So what is going on right now? The mystery of lawlessness is already at work, right? That is something that is happening right now. It was happening then, still happening now. The mystery of lawlessness is at work. What else is going on right now? There's a restraining power going on right now as well. We talked about that briefly, but let's keep talking about that here. So it says here in uh, verse 6, it says, You know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So there's an active restraining power going on with this mystery of lawlessness. Yeah, so who is this? Or what is this restrainer? Well, the passage doesn't say, does it? The passage does not say clearly, and in fact, Paul assumes that his readers already know. He says, you know. You know who this is. So he doesn't specifically say who or what this is, so we can't be 100% dogmatic, but I do believe that it's talking about the Holy Spirit here. So let's, let's think about this. If this was a mystery, uh, this was a restraining power that was present in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago almost, and it's still actively restraining today, can this be a person? It can't be, right? Because any person would be long gone by now. Is this a nation? Uh, probably not, because nations rise and fall, right? Roman already had its collapse. So there's been various nations that have come into existence that are no longer in existence. And when you think about this, the mystery of lawlessness, this is in the spiritual realm. This is something that is the power of the enemy. It's hidden. It's something that human beings don't see or perceive, and yet there's something actively restraining. So this is something that can perceive the spiritual realm, is not bound by time, and is extremely powerful and can restrain the enemy. The Holy Spirit does check all of those boxes as far as who or what is the restrainer. In John 16, 8, right, it talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this present age. He has come now that Jesus is gone, and he convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And it says he, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Yeah, Satan has already been judged, even if he's still uh, actively working behind the scenes right now in this age. But the Holy Spirit is able to uh, restrain, and there's a convicting power of what's going on. Yeah, maybe that is what's holding back the restraint, or holding back the mystery of lawlessness from trending too far, from being too far degraded of a society, the fact that the Holy Spirit is still convicting. Uh, but again, the passage doesn't say explicitly, so uh, we have to stay humble there. But what we can be dogmatic about here is that whatever this restraining power is, it's not going to be active forever, Right? There will come a time when it stops. It says it will do so until he is out of the way. So whoever or whatever the restraining power is, there is a timeline. There is a finite time that he's doing this, and eventually it will stop. And once the restraining power stops, then that mystery of lawlessness is going away. Translators actually have a hard time with this because it literally means like, like an opposition or a departure from so they're opposing something. They're departing from something. What exactly is that? And theologians debate. What does this mean? Who's falling away? Who is rebelling? What exactly is happening here? What is this group of people? Some say it's the church. Uh, they're rebelling against God. They're, they're departing from God. The church as a group is falling away. Some theologians say it's the world. Honestly, there's biblical support for both. Uh, in 2 Timothy Four, three, and four. We'll pull that up on the screen. We know that the church is actually going to experience a time that they are not well grounded as they should be towards the end. Second Timothy. Yeah, chapter four, verse three. It's talking about, it says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. 
and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's a really interesting statement when you think about it. Uh, what is truth? God's word is truth, right? And it says there will come a time when people aren't going to want that, but they are going to devote themselves to myths. They're going to devote themselves to their own passions. And so it seems like there's going to be a prioritization of human thinking, of human wisdom, of speculations, of this, that, and the other, but a departure from God's word. And it would seem that that's talking about the community of faith. That would seem like it's talking about the church. In the last days, it's going to have a drifting away from the truth. So there is biblical support for that view, but there's also perhaps even greater support for the world is going to rebel even further than it is right now. You think about our society right now and how far gone it is, how much opposed it is to God, truth, all of those things, it would seem to indicate that it's going to get even worse in the future. So 2 Timothy 3.13, right? 2 Timothy 3.13, it says, Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So from bad, yeah, we got bad. It's going to go from bad to worse. Wow. Deceiving and being deceived. Wow. So they're leading other people's people astray. They're also being led astray. The Bible says that the blind leads the blind. They'll both fall into a pit. Yeah. That's what's going to be happening in the last days. Luke 17 is an, another interesting passage if you just want to note that. It talks about how it's going to be like the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. So a reference there to the pre-flood world. The pre-flood world says that the thoughts of men were only on evil continuously. That's pretty bad. Uh, days of Lot, that's a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. If you've heard of these cities that God rained down fire and brimstone on and destroyed. So Luke 17 says that the end of time is going to be like that. People are going to drift. Uh, the world is going to rebel. It's going to be like the days of Noah when they're only thinking about evil continuously. It's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah where they are, man, we're ready to rain down fire and brimstone on these people. Yeah, uh, drifting away from the world. Not happening yet because the restrainer is still at work. The restrainer will lift that at some point. Matthew 24, 12. Interesting passage here. This is Jesus speaking. If you could pull that up on the screen. It uh, talks about how lawlessness will increase. And it's the same word that we're looking at here. With the mystery of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness. Um, talking about how because lawlessness increases, the love of many will grow cold. Interesting. That's an interesting way to put that. Let me read exactly how it says it. Oh, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. I nailed it. <laughs> Normally I mess something up in there. Uh, yeah, so lawlessness will be increased. Interesting. That's what we're talking about right here, right? We're talking about a mystery of lawlessness already at work, a restraining power keeping it from going too far, but eventually that is lifted and lawlessness will increase because lawlessness increases. That's what Jesus is talking about here, and the love of many will grow cold. So yeah, it's worse than it is right now. That's coming. So there's an apostasy or rebellion coming after the restraining influence is done here. And when that happens, when the lawlessness increases, when the world drifts further away from God than it is right now, when it rebels in a greater manifestation than it does right now, that is going to allow a certain individual to come on the scene. It's going to allow someone to rise to power who is not able to rise to power right now, but it will, uh, it will happen after when this happens. So verse 3 again. Remember, I'm kind of handling these out of order in the passage, trying to hit it chronologically. Right? Mystery of lawlessness at work now. Restrainer at work now. Future event. Restrainer is going to stop restraining. Then comes a rebellion. And then comes this. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. And so when this rebellion takes place, when this apostasy takes place, that's going to allow this man of lawlessness to come on the scene. 
a certain political figure who is able to rise to power because the world is ready for him at this point. They have moved further and further away. What does the Bible tell us about this guy? This is, this is interesting. Verse 4, the man of lawlessness, son of destruction, opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Right? So he opposes all deities. He takes his seat in the temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So he's going to claim that he is a deity, the supreme deity. It says that he takes his seat in the temple. Wow, that's a bold move. Um, exalts himself over all other deities. And that's verse 4. If you jump down to verse 9, it keeps going here with some other things about this guy. It says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. So he's empowered by Satan. Satan is behind this guy. And he's able to perform false signs and wonders. Right? So there's going to be things happening and people are going to be looking at it saying, Oh my goodness, what is this? Did you see what he just did? That's amazing. So there's going to be a deception taking place. Yeah, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And if we jump back up to verse 8, we see some more things. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So this is, guy, this is a guy still on the scene when Jesus comes back. He's still on the scene. And Jesus is going to take care of him personally. Jesus is going to take care of him personally. Just, and he's done. All right? It's no challenge for Jesus. There's no challenge. Darkness has no power over light. You turn on a light switch, the light shines, the darkness is gone. There's no challenge here. Uh, same thing with God versus Satan. It, this is not a challenge for him. Breath of his mouth, you're done. You seemed powerful, you took over the world, but you don't stand, you, you don't hold a candle to me. Yeah, so who is this guy? Who is the man of lawlessness? Well, it's interesting. We have references to this guy in other passages of Scripture, in Daniel and Revelation. Daniel and Revelation both make references to this individual, and it, it's it's like a, a puzzle piece. It's the exact same. We know that it's the same guy because the same descriptions are used of him, right? And so in Daniel, he's called the little horn. And in Revelation, he's called the beast. Now, maybe you've heard him referred to as the Antichrist. That's how we typically talk about him. Man of destruction, little horn, the beast. It's all talking about the same guy, the Antichrist. So here's a couple passages that we can look at here. So these first passages here, it says here in 2 Thessalonians that he's going to claim divinity, oppose all divinity. Daniel 11.37, when talking about the little horn here, this is what Daniel 11.37 has to say. I think our computer's running behind this morning. That's all right. We can look it up. Daniel 11.37. So it's talking about the little horn. It says, he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to uh, the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other gods, and he shall magnify himself above all. That's what it says here in 2 Thessalonians. He's opposing all deities, ex exalting himself above all other gods. He's claiming divinity. Yeah, supreme divinity is what this guy's going to claim, that I am the supreme God. That's what happens here in Daniel 11.37. Revelation 13 also makes reference. It's calling him the beast in that passage. Revelation 13.6 through 8. Okay, so it, it opened its mouth, talking about the beast. So the beast opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And the authority, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Anyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life or the lamb who was slain. 
So we see here that the beast is receiving worship in this passage. People are going to worship. So he is claiming divinity here. It also says he's going to blaspheme against God. So what is that but opposing God? Opposing himself against the other deities. So we see that here in 2 Thessalonians, right? The exact same description is used of this, this individual. Uh, we also see that he's powered by Satan. So this isn't just a, a guy, just a regular guy. No, Satan is actually behind this. Daniel 8.24 so in verse 9 of our passage, it says his, his false signs, his deception, uh, that's going to be from the power of the activity of Satan. Uh, Daniel 8 makes reference to this. Daniel 8, 24, talking about the little horn here, says his power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. So his power shall be great, but not his own power. So he's getting his power from a different power source, not himself. Doesn't say specifically that that's Satan there, but it does say, hey, this is a different power source that he's deriving this from. And back to Revelation 13, this is the same thing that it says about the beast. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and, his, and great authority. One of his said seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And so we see here that the dragon, Satan, has given his authority to the beast, right? So he's getting his power from someone else. This is a dark power that is backing him. And so that's what it's talking about here in Second Thessalonians. We know who this guy is based on these other scriptures that, yeah, this is who we commonly call the Antichrist. He's the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, and he will come on the scene once the rebellion takes place, once people have drifted further away from God, once lawlessness increases, the love of many grows cold. It's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Lot. These people are going to be ripe for a political leader like this who is actually claiming that he is God and opposing all other gods and performing these false signs and wonders and actually successfully deceiving those around him. Is this still a future thing? Yeah, I believe it is, um, and here's why. It says here that he's going to take his seat in the temple. Now, this was written in 50-ish A.D., this passage, and the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. So we've got a 20-year time span of when this could have happened, 20-year time span, and we don't know of anyone who actually did this who sat down in the temple and claimed to be God during that 20-year span. T uh, the Roman general Titus was the one who destroyed the temple, but he didn't claim deity. He never once sat in the temple and said, I'm God, and I oppose all their gods. He didn't do that. He did not perform false signs and wonders. So it can't be Titus. We don't know of anyone who fits this description. Now this assumes, then, if it's still a future event, that there will be a temple rebuilt. And maybe you heard, but there are things in the works to make that happen. Uh, they need a red heifer. Have you heard about the red heifer sacrifice? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Um, Numbers 19 is where that passage is. They need a red heifer for purification rituals. I'm talking the, the Israelites, the Jews. To actually build a temple, you have to have purification rituals take place. All the instruments, all the things have to be purified. And to do that, they sacrifice a red heifer, and they take those ashes from the red heifer, and they're able then to perform the purification rituals as specified in Numbers 19. Now, the problem with a red heifer is they're very rare, very rare. But a breeder actually bred for this trait recently, and they shipped five, six of them to, to Israel. The sacrifice may or may not have already happened. It's unclear. It's not like they have a YouTube account where you get a daily update on the Red Heifer Society. Um, it, it may or may not have already happened. They were planning on it, but I haven't seen an update. Uh, but they can perform that ritual at any time and save those ash ashes, and that can be 
uh, done at a later date. So there is an effort to rebuild the temple. It, is, it can happen really fast too. If enough people get together on this, you can rebuild a temple pretty fast. So this isn't something that, oh man, this is 20, 30 years away. Man, they could decide tomorrow where they're going to build this. They already have preparations made to make this happen. I believe the temple will be rebuilt because this guy is going to have to sit down in it and proclaim himself to be God. So it seems like that is going to be a future thing. By the way, the October 7th terrorist attack in Israel, part of the reason why that happened was those red heifers, right? And that this is Hamas actually explicitly saying this. They know that the red heifer is, signifies that, hey, we're rebuilding the temple here, um, and there are people who do not like that. And so that was one of the express reasons why they invaded and performed that terrorist attack on October 7th. The, they know that the red heifers are already in the country, and they know what it stands for. So that's just a little beside. So yeah, here we go. Uh, he is going to sit down in the temple. Interesting. So why is it here that God is telling us all this stuff? It's possible that uh, none of us are going to see the events of this passage. It's possible. So why would God tell us? This stuff. Well, for one, it shows that he is God. The fact that he can foretell things that are to come. Only God can do that. <laughs> She's okay. I would rather have crying kids on Sunday morning than no kids. Right? If we're a church that does not welcome uh, parents and their kids, uh, man, that's not a church I want to be a part of. So if a baby cries every now and then, it's okay. It's a blessing. Yes, it is. I hope that relieves any parents in the room. It's <laughs> totally fine. Totally fine. Okay, so is the, is the point of this passage the Antichrist? It's not the point of the passage, I don't believe. Let's go to verse 8. It says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The point of this passage is that Jesus is coming back. The point of this passage is that Jesus is more powerful than the enemy. It's not even a challenge for him. Poof, you're done. The point of this passage is that God already has a plan. God already knows exactly what's going to take place and nothing catches him by surprise. Do you think that God ordered all the events or can f tell everything that's going to happen in human history and he's not aware of what's going on in your life? It says that he's intimately aware that a sparrow, the most common mundane of birds, yeah, he knows about the sparrow. He knows how many he hairs, of, hairs are on your head. He's got that numbered. That's not, a, that, that's not a trivial detail to him. He's so intimately familiar with you and your life that he can count the hairs on your head. For some of us, that is easier than others. Doesn't matter. It's easy for him. Now, he's intimately aware, and he's intimately aware with what you're going through this morning. Whatever that may be, whatever you're going through this morning, and he already knows how it's going to turn out. He's not sitting beside you wringing his hands like you're wringing your hands. Um, no, he's sitting beside you, totally aware of exactly where these events in your life are going, and he's wanting to stand right beside you and walk with you through them, and he's wanting you to trust him through that and to walk with him. Man, he knows all of these things, he knows exactly what's going on in your life. The focus is on Jesus and the fact that he is totally in control. The fact is that he is coming back as well. What does that imply? It implies that our time is limited. One of the greatest lies of our society, one of the greatest things that our society has done is to make us so busy that we don't contemplate the fact that our time is finite. Right? We're just trying to get through the day. We're just trying to get through the week. Just trying to get to the weekend so I can have a little bit of a breath. And uh, we wind up just sitting on the couch and, 
<sighs> and then next thing you know, we start it all up again. And that is what our society has engineered. I believe it's a scheme of the enemy. Keep us so busy that we don't contemplate the fact that our time is short and our time is running out. No matter how long that time is, we don't know. Uh, for some of us, it could be longer than others. What? Jesus could come back while I'm still talking, and uh, then we're all done. So the time is running out, and what does that necessitate then? It necessitates an urgency on our part, not fr franticness, but an urgency to put things in their proper priority in our life because we realize we're not going to be able to accomplish all of these things. Only some of these things can get done because my time is running out. What if I could only do one thing? What would I prioritize? I would prioritize God, his word, his kingdom, his purposes, something that is of eternal value. You know, only, only two things of eternal value. God, and by default, his word, right? His words endure forever. God, his word, those go together, and people. People are going to last forever as well. There's your two things of eternal value. Spending time with God and his word, his truth, or investing in people. Those are your two things of eternal value. Now, we have to go to work. I get it. We have to f eat. We're physical people. But we have to connect those things back to eternal purposes because our time is short. Yeah. So what did we talk about this morning as we wrap up? We talked about these events that are coming in the future. We've talked about what is happening right now. It's going to get worse, <laughs> but we don't have to worry about that because, man, God has everything under control and everything was proceeding according to his plan. We can trust God. There's another takeaway for you. We can trust God because he is intimately aware of the details. He's told us what we need to know, and he is very much involved in the situation. So we can trust him in that. And we can also trust him, if we can trust him with these big things, these uh, climactic events of human history, we can trust him in our own lives. We can trust him when, man, uh, a loved one is facing a health battle. We can trust him when our kids are walking away and we don't know what to do. We can trust him when we get a flat tire. All these things, he's looking for us to hit our knees and talk to him in relationship, search his word, and to move forward, not be trembling in fear, understanding, yeah, our God is above all gods. He's above every other name, and he's already seen the end from the beginning. And our time is short. Our time is limited. So today, today, while it's today, yeah, we have to put things in their proper place, their proper priority, their proper perspective. Let's not go the course of the world where we get all wrapped up in things that don't matter. There are things that are of eternal value, and that's what matters most. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you uh, do know all the, all the details. You know how it's all going to work out, Father. There's plenty, I'm sure, God, that you have not told us about what's coming. But, Lord, you have told us something about what's coming. And you've told us what we need to know. So, God, that is enough for us. Uh, we rest in that fact. There's a comfort and a reassurance that comes from knowing that we have exactly what we need. And, uh, Lord, as we sang earlier, um, God, we know that you are a firm foundation. Your word is a firm foundation to those who uh, apply it to their lives, who don't just leave it up in their heads and uh, just kind of think about it and ponder on it, Lord. It's uh, those who hear your words and do them. Father, when the storms come, the rains blow, the, the winds blow and the rains fall, Father, against the house, uh, it stands firm, Father, for the person who is holding fast to your word and applying it to their lives. And so, Father, show us how to uh, apply this passage. Um, everything that we still don't understand about this passage, Lord, we pray that you continue to teach us and uh, show it to us in your time. And we lift it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.